rest of you to go with me for the final time in this series, at least, to the letter of 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, Lord willing, we'll be completing this text this morning. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 to 21 this morning in your Bible or in a uh, app or however you uh, have that. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are some pew Bibles sprinkled around there. And if you don't have a Bible, just go ahead and take that one home. That's a gift to you. And we want to, because the authority is not what in a guy up behind a piece of wooden furniture has to say, but the truth is found in the Word of God, in the Scriptures, the inspired, inerrant, sufficient Word of God. Ask God to help us and read the text. Let's ask God to help us one more time. Father, we ask that you would now take up the sword of the Spirit. Lord, we trust him to do his work through his sword. Lord, it is such a wonderful thing to have the confidence that your word is sure. That regardless of the medium of the messenger, that the message from your word is powerful. It is life-giving. It is the means by which you edify your people. It's the means by which you call people to repentance and faith in Jesus. It's the means by which you convict us. It's the means by which you grow us and comfort us and give us assurance of salvation. So Lord, we thank you for that. I thank you for the privilege of opening this book and sharing it. Lord, we ask that you would help us to become, be and remain dependent and trusting in you. Give us ears to hear. Lord, help us to be listeners of your word and give us submissive hearts to it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin reading in verse 13. This is God's word. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have heard, we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. And we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the one who does not touch him. And we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is God's word. So many, many years ago, when Jamie and I were engaged, and she walked back in hearing a story about herself, and so I'm sure that's not awkward for her at all. Uh, and I was, we were, we were engaged, we got married on August 7th, 2004, and um, the internet wasn't just on everybody's phones back then, you actually had to go to these things called libraries, and log in, and research things, and so um, I was planning our honeymoon, and, and Jamie likes excitement, and spontaneity, and stuff like that, and I do not, and so, and so I thought, but I asked her, I was like, what do you think about if I don't tell you where we're going to go for our honeymoon and just surprise you. And, and I said, we could, and, and she's like, well, how do you plan? I was like, how about if you pack two suitcases, one for if it's going to be warm weather and one if it's going to be cold weather, and then I'll just tell you when we're leaving which one to bring. 
And, um, and you will be surprised to hear that she's like, I don't really care where we go. I just, I want to know where I'm going. Like, she, she, wanted, to know, she wanted to know that. And, uh, and how many of you would have been in her boat and say, yeah, I want to know where I'm going. I just want to, like, find out. I want, I want to have a little bit of confidence of where I'm going. And if, and if we want that type of certainty and confidence about something as silly as, as a vacation— how much more confidence should we want to have about where we're going after we depart this earth, right? Um, we live in a world that is, has everything but certainty. I mean, the, the world, I mean, I mean, unless you've had your head in the sand for the last 60 days or so, the world is different now in a different way than it has been in most of our lifetimes, um, I mean, it's really since the end of World War II, I mean, the world is totally different. It's not seen this type of um, volatility and things like that. So not just on the world stage, but also like w w there's uncertainty in, in the stock market. And, and what's going on, there's, there's fluctuation in the economy and the increase of taxes and change of this and the oil, uh, barrels of oil, gas prices, and all these things lead to a lot of uncertainty. There's uncertainty financially in that way. We, there's a lot of lives about relationships, you know, that uh, uh, relationships that come and go, that there are some people that are uh, uh, faithful and then those that are flighty, and there are people that, um, uh, that, that people are people, people are people. That's, we say that all the time. Um, and people, some of people might, might take off when they don't feel like their needs or wants are being met, and there's an uncertainty that leads to everything. And marriages, that, that this perpetuality of prenuptial agreements, which is basically planning your divorce before you plan your marriage, to um, r uh, business transactions and uncertainty with how business partners work and all the paperwork that goes on, there's uncertainty about everything. There's uncertainty about the weather. Um, I, I have learned here on the Jersey uh, Shore to, when I look the night before at what the weather forecast is, to don't put a ton of stock in that because it, things change, right? Uh, it's going to rain tomorrow, and then you wake up and the sun's out. And you're like, oh, okay, well, um, you just got to, there's uncertainty. But that's on the little level, but on with hurricanes, earthquakes, natural disasters, tornadoes, fires, floods, there's uncertainty about everything. And that's one of the reasons why for our earthly treasures, we want things on them like insurance, um, because you never know what's going to happen with, with that. There's uncertainty about our future, whether you're going to live really long, and so you need to plan in retirement, or whether you're going to live really short, and you need to plan in life insurance. And there's whole industries devoted to this uncertainty that we feel and know about life. And all of that uncertainty in the world pales in comparison with the uncertainty that might come towards the spiritual realm of where will I spend eternity? Where will you spend eternity and those who put their p hope in uncertain and false religions and personal ideologies never come to a certain level of confidence or a certain state so in the turmoil in the context of the church and the people that john the apostle is writing to them they've had various heretical groups leave, false teachers leave, people, they've had a split in the church. In the midst of that, John is writing to them to come to a settled certain place and have confident assurance of their own salvation. And it's very practical. And so those of you that are here in this room or watching this video or listening to this recording, do you know that you're saved. Do you know that you're saved? In fact, I want everybody here, uh, if you have a pen or pencil, or maybe just something down, or maybe just write it down in your head, on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that, I'm not wishing anything bad on anybody, that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven or not? One being not certain, 10 being totally certain. Maybe jot that down. Keep that private. Keep it in your head. Keep it on, write it on a piece of paper or maybe on a note on your phone. And if you are not able, say one to ten, how sure,
confident are you that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven or not? Now, if you weren't able to jot down a 10, this text is for you. Assurance isn't something that just young Christians and teenagers struggle with. It is something that we all go through at times when we need comfort from the scriptures. It may take time. Some people might need to hear this again and again. It may take time to come to assurance. Both the Westminster Confessions and the Baptist Confessions recognize this struggle and to say that this infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he, before he be partaker of it. Meaning, this we might not have assurance, doesn't mean you might not have the essence of faith and be a true believer, but there's a struggle that comes with this. So if you aren't able to put a 10 there, this message is for you. But maybe you say, well, hey, I know I'm saved. Okay? How many of you, how many of you have ever seen someone who calls themselves a Christian sin? Right? Yeah. Then this message is for you too. But how do you respond? And so in a world of uncertainty, the Bible comes to us with certainty, objectivity, rational truth that is foundational, that is absolute. And so John wants these believers and you by reading this and by partaking of this to come to a settled place where you have confident assurance of eternal life and that that confident assurance of eternal life will lead you to confident prayer for the Christian community. To have confident assurance of your eternal life and that would lead to you having confident prayer for your brothers and sisters who are sinning in the Christian community. And so there are four purpose statements by, that John gives in the letter of 1 John. So if you're writing a paper, if you're reading a book, what's the thesis? What's the, what's the point? What's the big art? Well, when someone says, this is why I wrote this, pretty good clue, right? I mean, he's being right there. But John gives four of them. In chapter one, he says, I'm writing these things that your joy may be full. In chapter two, he said, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. In chapter two, verse 26, he says, I'm writing these things about those who are trying to lead you astray. And here in chapter five, he says, I write these things that you may know that you have eternal life. So four of the big purposes of the letter of first John are to promote joy in the child of God, to prevent the child of God from committing sin, to protect the children of God from false teachers, and to provide assurance of salvation. But most scholars, most Bible students, will point to this of those four as being really the theme of the entire book of 1 John, to give us confident assurance. And so throughout the book of 1 John, John has been giving us kind of three ideas that how assurance comes about for the Christian. And those three ideas start out split up at the beginning of the book of 1 John, then they're kind of interwoven together as, they, as we came to the end of 1 John. And so he's not, he's, he's weaves those things together. So this pastoral letter from the beloved disciple to this church, he's dealing with this very practical issue concerning the integrity of the gospel. And, that, and so they're shaken about their surety of salvation and what genuine Christianity looks like. And we all need that reminder. So he gives them that moral test of do you obey God's command, that doctrinal test, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that love test, do you love the children of God, interwoven as these three evidences, these three indicators that one is a partaker. And we saw as we got to chapter 5 that, that all of these three evidences of salvation were all contingent upon one thing, the new birth. And that was a couple of weeks ago when we talked about how you must be born again and this new birth happens. And so you don't have the, you don't show the resemblances of the family until you're born into that family, right? And so when you're, so the, the key, the main thing is to receive 
the, the gift of salvation and experience the new birth and be born again. So John has written this so that we can have this confident assurance of eternal life. That those professing believers might be able to test the genuineness of their faith. That true believers would be assured of their right standing with God. Now, some people think that it is uncaring and rude to question the genuineness of someone's faith. Um, when the truth is that nothing can be further from the truth. That, that the most caring thing you do is say, Brother, are you sure you're a believer? Um, 1 Corinthians, Paul, tagged in with John here. He says, examine yourselves to see if whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. And someone might say, well, that's none of our business. No, that is exactly what our business is. That is the business of the church. It's literally what we do. God wants you to have confident assurance of salvation. That these, we acknowledge our sin before God and we believe in him. And this it has effects in our lives. And so um, they, they come together in this, that we're believing on Jesus and we experience a new birth. We, 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 and then, so John wants these Christians to have confidence. And the first thing that he wants them to have confidence is that Jesus is God. And we saw that last week when we saw the three witnesses and the spirit and the blood and the water. Those witnesses to Jesus being the divine son of God. And that we would know this. So he wants to demonstrate that there's more than sufficient evidence to prove that Jesus is the Son of God, and who, the Son of God who provides life to all who would believe on him. But then he gets very practical when he says, I'm writing to you that you would know that you have eternal life. Now, think about this. This is where the, the assurance, the, the, the sufficiency of the Bible comes in. Let's pretend you are a pastor and you go to a church that's just had a split what is the first thing you would preach on after a church had a split some people might think about reconciliation and relationships and things like that what does John address to this church that's had this split assurance of salvation because when there's a lot of uncertainty and things are crazy and changing we start questioning everything. And then we're, am I really a child of God? Does it, what, what does this genuine faith look like? And that's what he does. And so um, John writes them about coming to a place to know that they belong to God. Verse 13. I'm writing these things that you may know. Do you have assurance of salvation? This is the proposition of life, eternal life. You who are having, you are having. This eternal life has now, not just in the future. Its implications is now. So he's not writing. Now think about this. John, I use this passage in evangelism and having gospel conversations and sharing with people about how they can know they have eternal life. But do you know what the context is of this? John is not using this I mean, I think there is an evangelistic thrust to it. Definitely, because there's always a mixed multitude amongst the church. But, but the, the main writing, the initial audience was Christians. He's not writing to persuade unbelievers primarily of the truth of the Christian faith, but to strengthen the belief of Christians. I write to you that you, Christians, would know that we have eternal life. So John wrote this epistle to prove to his readers provide them with certainty about all that God has revealed concerning salvation. And he goes, and they believe in his name that you may know. I mean, he used the, the, this, this section in, in 1 John, uh, he uses that word no, no, no. In fact, right there in 13, 15, twice in 15, one, verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, to know, we know, we know. He wants them to know that they know so. And when he uses it over and over, he uses that word a lot in 1 John, but especially here at the end of chapter 5, you think he's probably giving us an idea. He's repeating a word. This is what he wants us to know, to have this confidence. And this is the confidence, verse 14. So what, what comes? What comes from? What's the byproduct of having assurance of salvation? Confidence. You know, sometimes... Sometimes um, preachers 
in churches that stand on the authority of the word of God and preach that with confidence are accused of being narrow-minded, arrogant, uh, you, you, you know, that, that overly proud. But there is a difference. I mean, we shouldn't be proud and we shouldn't be arrogant. But, but when you know something is true, there's a confidence that comes with that, right? I, I've heard a story of uh, there was a, uh, you know, some um, mariners going back and forth uh, of what they were. Um, and, and this one is, is uh, uh, saying, hey, this is a large ship. You guys need to move, change your course. We're going to collide. And the other says, no, you need to change your course. Um, and, and the other guy goes, no, this is a battleship. You need to change your course. And the other comes back and says, well, this is a lighthouse. You need to change your course, right? I mean, they're, they're, you're not being arrogant. You're just saying this is the truth, right? There's a confidence that comes with this. And so, and so he says, we have this confidence towards him. So assurance leads us to confidence. That word confidence there, it means to have a freedom of speech or a boldness or an openness. Confidence means you can come and talk to that person. Hey, I, I can just talk to him. He's, he, he's my father. Now, I know him. I'm one of his kids. I can just walk in. I don't have to get an appointment. I can come boldly before the throne of grace, as we read in our opening of the service and our call to worship. He's not writing to persuade unbelievers of this truth, but to strengthen Christian believers that they would have confidence. So assurance brings us to confidence. And we come to verse 14, and we have this confidence towards him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So assurance leads to a boldness in prayer. This ass confident assurance of salvation leads us to boldness and confidence in our prayer lives. So he's writing to bring them to this place of settled assurance. And, so, so, and what is an evidence of assurance of salvation? Boldness in prayer. Why assurance? And he's also showing us that for those of you who, like myself, and I'm here, that I wrestled with assurance for so long, allows us, assurance allows us to look outside of ourselves. Often when we're wrestling with contemplating assurance, our, the, our own spiritual state, there, there is a sense, and I'm not accusing anyone of this particularly, but there is a sense in which it's kind of a narcissism because it's overly focused on self and my, my walk with God and my relationship with God and not looking outside of myself. It's kind of like the guy there while the church is having a work day and everybody, all the other men are working and he's standing around the corner thinking, ah, oh, I wonder what my spiritual gift is. I really should take a few more surveys about that. We're like, we're all working, man. Like, get with the, get, pick up a shovel. Let's go, you know? And um, you don't stand around watching other people work, right? And um, so, so uh, assurance allows us to look outside of ourselves and be in prayer for other people rather than always being consumed with our own spiritual state. And he says, so he has this confidence that we have towards him that if we ask anything, <clears throat> here's the qualification, according to his will, he hears us. According to his will. Assurance leads us to confident prayer according to the will of God. Prayer according to God's will. Verse 15. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, remember according to his will, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Prayer according to God's will, which he hears favorably and expects to answer. John specifically wrote these verses to encourage you and me to pray. And then verse 16, he gives an, a, a specific example. If anyone sees his brother committing sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. Specific example, how should we respond when we see a brother or sister sinning? This is very, very practical. I kind of think it's funny when I hear people say, yeah, we just need to make the Bible more relevant. I'm like, 
okay, you have to work at that? Like, have you not seen, I mean, this happens every day. We see other people claiming to be Christians sinning. We look in the mirror and see ourselves sinning. So how do we, how should we respond? We will all see someone today that claims to be a Christian sinning. How should we respond according to this text? Pray for that person. Practical, confident prayer for members of the Christian community that you see sinning. This is an example of prayer according to the will of God. When you pray for a Christian brother or sister to repent of sin, you know that is God's will. It's kind of like people say, hey, I'm praying about whether I ought to start coming back to church or not. Nothing to pray for. You know that's God's will, right? Uh, I'm pr- you're, you know you're praying according to God's will. God is favorable. He wants to hear us pray. He wants to pray, and he, and he loves to hear us pray for something he already wants to do, right? And so, so it's like, how practical is this? When that moment happens, when you see another, someone who claims to be a believer in Jesus and you see them sin, what happens in that moment when you see that? When you see them lose their temple, temp, temple, lose their temper, when you see them exhibit selfishness, when you see them show elements of greed. And this is all the stuff that my wife sees in me, right? I mean, when you see someone being covetous or lusting or being unkind or going down the wrong path of life, what is your first reaction when you see that? Is it to be judgmental and judge them? Is it to be angry with them or upset with them? Is it to throw that sin back in their face? Or is it to pray for them? And I'll tell you what, this hits me right in the, between the eyes too. What is my first reaction when I see another professing believer sinning? Is it judgment, anger, throwing it in their face, or is it to pray for them? Pray that God would grant them repentance and life. And so let's propose today to be the type of people who says, I'm going to pray for other people when I see them sinning. Maybe write that down. I want to be the type of person that prays for other people when I see them sinning. Let us be the people. Let us be a church that is eager to pray for brothers and sisters who are sinning. Because you know what? We are all in that state of sinning at one point or another. Now, now we come to the side question that many of you have probably been wondering about as soon as we got to this passage, where it says there, and this is our little Bible trivia, we're going to go a little bit into the weeds on this one, and um, where it says, um, if anyone sees a brother committing sin, he shall ask God, he will give it to him to those who commit sin that do not lead to death. And then the next sentence, there is a sin unto death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that we should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. What is the sin unto death? What is the sin that leads to death? And we're just going to open the mic up right now and let you come up and give your opinions, right? No, we're not. (laughs) Well, I am going to share. Now, here's the thing. There are things that we are very confident in what the Bible says, and there are other things that good Christians and people can disagree upon. And so I'm going to share what the main arguments and opinions are that people have, and then I'll, and then I'll, because, uh, and then I'll share what I, where I think it lands, and I think there are two really strong possibilities of what this means, because that's really what our question is. What does this mean, right? Not what does it mean to me, but what did John mean for it to say, right? That's the, the, that's the, that's the question. And so, uh, what is the sin unto death? Well, some people would claim that this is the blasphemy under the Holy Spirit, and we see in Matthew 12, or what we, was commonly known as the unpardonable sin. Other people would, there's another second opinion that said this is a heinous or deadly sin, or specific sins that are, like, just really, really bad, that lead to death. Um, A third position is that this is an apostasy where a genuine believer 
uh, apostatizes from the faith. And fourth, this is a, a, a position is that this is a sin by a believer that leads to physical death as a result of God's discipline on their life. So in order to answer that question, and which of those positions is really the right one, or is it a combination of them, the first thing is to question is, is the person in question here a believer or not? Because if they are a believer, a true believer cannot apostatize from the faith. If they're a believer, or, or, and, if, and, and then the other argument is that if it's with some heinous sin that leads to death, whether by an unbeliever or a believer, the Bible really doesn't give us, it gives some indicators in the Old Testament that there are uh, certain sins with certain consequences different than others. But this idea that this modern construct of uh, um, venial, venial and mortal sins is not in the Bible. Um, and that's how grace is infused and how you need to get that bank of righteousness through sacraments filled back up because whether it was a venial or a mortal sin, that's just not in the Bible. Now, the New Testament does share that there are some sins that have different consequences unto the other. For instance, when it says that who commits fornication sins against his own body, uh, and there might be some where there's different consequences of certain sins, but the Bible really doesn't say, okay, certain sins are worse than others in this way, because you say, okay, well, what's one of the worst sins? Okay, well, a murderer. Well, there are murderers that God, I mean, you could think of like these, these certain sins, and there are um, Christian, there, like there's a, in one of the apostles was a Christian terrorist that committed jihad against the church. In, in the Apostle Paul. There's an adulterer murderer in David. There are thieves. There are tax evaders and embezzlers that become apostles. And so the, the, I think it's, we can rule out that this idea that there are certain heinous sins that lead to death. Um, and that, that Christians sin so serious or, or whatever. Um, so if, this person's, so if this person's a Christian, we could rule certain things out. If they're not a Christian, then this may be that final rejection of Jesus, of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or the unpardonable sin. And let me just say, if you're here and you're like, hey, Jason, I'm worried if I've committed the unpardonable sin or not. And let me just tell you, with confidence, if you are worried that you've committed the unpardonable sin, you have not. Okay? Um, so if it's a, um, the, uh, the, uh, if this person is a non-believer, it could be the final rejection or a total rejection. I kind of think it leads this way. A total rejection of the gospel, if they're an unbeliever. And if it's a believer, it may be that, is, uh, that a Christian can sin so serious. And I say sin, not a specific sin, but a pattern of sin that the, the Lord determines to be so serious enough to warrant as part of his discipline upon them to take them to glory early. It's a clear example of that in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira. So which one of these is right? Well, positiveness to several of them to, uh, that offer, but it seems to me, according to the context, that when he says, if you see a brother committing sin, not leading to death, that it's in the context of this believer, and it says, and not the sin leading to death. So it's also in the, con so in the context, he's talking about this believer you see sinning to death, but in the context of this church that has had these false teachers that had a wrong view of Jesus, who Jesus is, that saying Jesus had not come into the flesh, chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 4, when we talked about uh, discernment, that they had these people that didn't believe who Jesus was. They'd left who, the true teaching on Jesus, that he's kind of saying, this is... Not, not the sin of those leaving the faith, entering into some heretical Christology, but a Christian who's wandered into sin to pray 
I think that's where he's going with that. And I think that um, is, leads to the, the best of those. I think there may be some ev- element to the one leading into death as far as a Christian taking sinning a uh, pattern of sin seriously long enough that God in judgment ends their life early or whatnot. But I think they're, they're that, that um, the way it's going. I hope that makes sense. Um, you can explain that to me later if you've got a better answer. Um, all right. So then he gets to verse 20. Where he said, so anyone who's been born of God uh, does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. And then that's another we know. Verse 19, we know that we are from God, and that the world lies in power of the evil one. So he's reminding us of these realities of the world. And then verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, the eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. He is, John does not hesitate. Look at verse 20. John does not hesitate. To use the word theos, or God, in reference to Jesus Christ. He does not hesitate in calling Jesus God. He is hearkening back to what he's been talking about since chapter 1, about Jesus and his divinity. In fact, let's go back and just read the first couple verses of chapter 1. It says, That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was manifest, and we have seen it and testify it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And so he is right out of the gate. He has done this. Jesus is the divine son of god he is incarnate he doesn't mince words with this he's okay using theos and then jesus he plays there he's proclaiming this that this is christ true christians believe this and it matters this theology this is pre-existent one the, the from the beginning one this is so important concerning the word of life the message about life the message about eternal life the message about who jesus is who he who has the son has life and who doesn't have the son doesn't have life and then he ends by using that phrase that he's used so many times in first john little children are those beloved ones that he knows they're loved so he's writing hard things but he's reminding them hey you you're loved keep yourselves from idols idols maybe not a physical idol that one would worship, but wrong understandings about who Jesus is, is idolatry. Worshiping another God is idolatry. Or worshiping God and saying we're worshiping God, but worshiping Him according to our own imagination and our own understanding or what we want to do that. These are all distortions, idolatries, distortions of Christianity. Sometimes in the name of Christianity. We see idolatry all over the place. Keep yourselves from idols. So to go back to this entire message, do you know that you have eternal life? Are you, do you have assurance of salvation? If you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? And there is so much uncertainty in the world. Back in 1994, Northwest Airlines did a promotional program called Mystery Fair. And Mystery Fair was you would buy this Mystery Fair and you would show up for a weekend round trip flight and you would find out when you got to the airport where it was going to go. And for some people that worked out really well. They got a cheap flight and they got to go someplace really cool. For other play- people that did not work out well. Uh, to have, to to just, you know, you think you're going to Florida and you end up in Wisconsin, you know? Um, And most of us probably wouldn't want to take gambles like that. 
But how sad that there are people here and watching this and listening to this that you're kind of taking a gamble with eternity. And John is written specifically for you to know that you have eternal life, to believe on the Son of God, that you would know that you have eternal life. That invitation is for you today. And Christian, if you have that, it should lead you to bold, confident prayer, especially in an example of that is when you see other Christians sinning, that we would be a people and say, I'm going to be the type of person that when I see another brother or sister sinning, I'm going to pray for them. And we'd be that type of people. Let's have heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to pray and we'll close out things. But before I do that, the last three or four weeks, we've talked a lot about salvation and receiving the gift of eternal life. And I want to make sure, I don't want to manipulate or guilt or anything like that. But I want to make sure that we give an opportunity for someone to respond to this. And so with no one else looking around, if you would like if you're saying, I need to believe on Christ, I need to be saved. I've, already, I've asked some folks to be, there's a back room behind us. And if you would just slip out there and go to that back room, someone's going to meet you and maybe take someone else and, and talk to you about that. You can do that now. You can do that right now. You want to get up right now, walk to the back. Um, or maybe while we're singing, you can just walk straight to the back room. Um, and, and someone's going to be there and talk to you about, uh, about this. Maybe you're a Christian and you're like, I need to be praying for when I see other people sinning and I want them to be praying for me when they see me sinning. Um, and there's someone that comes to mind right now. And so in, your, in the quietness, just pray. Pray that God would give them repentance and life. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is sure and certain. Lord, I thank you that we can have confident assurance of salvation. I pray for the one here now who may be struggling with whether they are saved or not. I pray that you would give them the courage to talk to somebody. They need to talk to them. They can just reach out in their heart and believe upon you. I pray for the Christian who is sinning. That I ask that you would give them repentance and life. And Lord, it is so comforting to be able to pray that and know that we're praying according to your will. Lord, apply this text as you would for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're just going to dismiss the service now and have some time of fellowship and to think upon these things. And as we're being dismissed, there's that overflow room if you'd like to talk to someone about being saved. So God bless. Have a great week.